Mum sent me to the shops for bread and milk. Age 11. There I am walking through my neighbourhood. Only to be shouted at and approached by three white adults. Males. Stop right there. Keep your hands where I can see them. I was grabbed. Manhandled. Accosted. My princely dignity shattered. My human rights ignored. My peace of mind invaded. The sacredness of my youth and innocence desecrated. Slammed to the floor. Pockets rifled through. What's your details, fella? What's your name? Where do you live? Right here, I wanted to shout out. Right here. Where'd you get this money? The officer's voice sounded cold and robotic. I remember thinking he sounded like he hated me. I'd never met him before. I was alone in my neighbourhood, running an errand for my mum. I didn't deserve that. Age 8. Gloucester Grove Primary School. Peckham. North Peckham Estate to be exact. The rain meant that it was my favourite part of school. Wet play. We got a chance during break to watch movies. Paint. Play with soft balls in the hall. Read. Make plasticine models. You know. Kid shit. I chose to play on the class keyboard. Tapping away at the keys. I probably had that rumba or foxtrot drum pattern on auto thinking I'm the next Beethoven. The door swung open to an angry face, red man. A middle aged teacher named John. Who the hell was it? He demanded. I looked at my friend Zoe, a beautifully creative and hippie like white girl that was defo one of my best friends in the playground. We walked home to, to North Peckham Estate after school many times, cracking jokes, knocked down ginger. She looked just as confused. I looked at Andrew, the eight-year-old white, slightly overweight, spectacled wrestling enthusiast. He was just as baffled. Right, young man, come with me. Mr. John's crooked pink finger pointed at me. What preceded was one of many incidents where an innocent boy was racially profiled and accused of offences he was innocent of. This time it was breaking a random window in a different part of the school. My pleas of innocence were ignored and I was found guilty. No trial. If it hadn't been for a confession that surfaced later in the day, my mum would have probably had to have foot the bill. And that would have spelt big trouble for me. Age 27. The stairways filled with the rancid stench of stale cigarette smoke. Trapped breath and a lack of flannel. This was always a sign that Judy, the 60 year plus lady who lived upstairs, had opened the door in the last few hours. Walking upstairs to my flat. On the top floor, I passed Judy's open door. Hello, I called out in my perfected, non-threatening, I'm black, I'm big, but I'm kind and responsible and reasonable voice. Every six foot two black man with muscles that wants to make it socially in this white man's world must have several tones, accents and speech patterns at his disposal in order to make everyone else feel safe and secure from the worst fear of a murderous, snarling nigger being the last thing that they see. Hi Judy. Please close your door. The smell out here is intense. Maybe you could open your windows in the flat? Fuck off! The hostility oozed off the two words. Now you fuck off. My I'm, friend I'm friendly, I'm polite, but don't try mug me off voice was activated. Close your damn door. Nobody wants passive smoke just to get in, just to get in their house. I didn't wait for a response. I actually cussed myself for engaging with her. 
As I reached my door and pulled out the key, I heard footsteps behind me. It was my direct neighbour that lived on my floor, Tabitha. A manically depressed, unemployed, overweight, underfucked, single, 42-year-old white woman with dyed black hair and cats. Don't you tell Judy to fuck off, she screeched. Don't you dare give her grief. Oh, stay out of it, Tabitha. You have no idea what happened. Well, you shouldn't be attacking her. Typical language, I'm used to it. I just laughed it off. Attacking her, you know. I didn't attack her. She told me to fuck off. Anyway, mind your own business. I pushed the key into the door and entered. As I turned to close my own front door, behind me, Tabitha stuck her privileged foot in. Are you nuts? I asked. Move your foot. No, she spat defiant, her volume at an all-time high. I'm not finished talking to you. Move your foot, I demanded, increasing the volume to match hers. Make me. Oh, <laughs> the thought of actually making her dance seductively around my head. The adrenaline had started pouring in, and yet again, I found myself in a fight. Everyday fight. Every year fight. All my life. Fight. The fight every black man knows. Fighting your instincts. Fighting your frustration. Fighting your right to defend yourself. Fighting the urge to give as good as you get. Fighting for your rights. Why the fight? Because if you don't fight and you end up reacting like a human... It could spell the end of your liberty or even your life. I composed myself and took a deep breath. Tabitha was hurling a nonsensical barrage of words at me. I disengaged from her attempts to rile me. Just move your fucking foot, bitch. She was startled, as if seeing me for the first time. Her eyes drank up my form, my muscles, my height, my energy. She had a defeated look in her glaring eyes I'm calling the police she was doing a Karen for fuck's sake if at first you don't succeed in winding up an innocent man calm yourself down call the police and have the weight of white supremacy come down on him do you think I care was my response but I was already dreading the infinite possibilities that could unfold my neighbour's being aggressive threatening He's really intimidating, she sang with glee. I slammed my door and waited for the police. They came. They sided with her. They asked for my details. You ever been in trouble with the police, mate? They judged me. They gave me a warning. They expected gratitude for the warning. They writ it all down. They cared not for my account. They are always against me. They are police. Age 23. I'm walking in Croydon with my partner and pushing our year old son in, her, in, his, bug, in his buggy. Sorry. Age 23. I'm walking in Croydon with my partner pushing our one year old son in his buggy. My attention is drawn to a group of about seven to eight schoolboys. No older than 13, all in uniform, laughing and joking as they walked. High frequency beings enjoying adolescence and life. I watched as three cars of police pulled up and confronted the children. I watched as three cars of police pulled up and confronted the children. I watched as they were roughly manhandled and thrown against bushes and garden gates. I watched as a literal giant officer, nearly seven foot, Officer McFuckery leaned and grabbed on a child barely over five foot. A child that was complying. A child that looked scared. A child that could have been me. I looked from the youth being hassled to my own prince in the buggy. I had no option. Wait here, babes. I walked over to the group. What have they done, officer? I asked a stray policeman that didn't seem to have too much involvement with the festivities. 
Just a routine checkmate, he replied. Imagine this is routine. Imagine this is normal activity where I'm from. I stood silently observing, but not absorbing. My aim was to be a witness, a deterrent for abuse of power, but not be obstructive. I stood off to the side, at least three, four metres away. Move away, was the first time Officer McFuckery, the near seven foot policeman with the buck fifty Mars bar scar on his right cheek spoke to me. I'm not bothering you, was my reply. He started approaching me. I moved away before he could reach me and stood on the opposite side of the group of children and officers. Move away, he shouted. I'm just here to make sure the youngsters are okay, I replied. What proceeded was an officer of the peace, an officer, an ambassador of the law, a person that had taken an oath to uphold the peace and serve the community, assaulted me, an innocent bystander, a witness, pushed me three or four times into the road and then placing me into a chokehold. All the officers surrounding the schoolboys came to assist their colleague in restraining me and all the schoolboys ran off. Twelve officers in total. An angry crowd gathered as the police attempted to overpower me. The whole time I hoped somebody in the crowd, anybody in the crowd, would be moved to physically help me. I was punched. I was struck with batons. I was threatened with gas. I was threatened with tasers. With officers on each limb, I mean literally each limb, I was taken into custody. I thought I heard my baby cry. Or maybe it was just the sound of my soul almost cracking under the pressure of the experiences just like this that had become a staple in my life. In the van I was called a nigger. A black cunt, a piece of shit. I was charged with assault of a police officer, resisting arrest and a public order offence. I could give you 30 more stories a lot like this. They're way more graphic, way more shocking. But I'll keep them stories for another time. I hate the Black Lives Matter movement because they're trying to hijack my experience and manipulate the sentiments and the pain and the rage that many of us have felt being black and living in a white man's world. We've all heard George Soros being um, the funder behind the movement. I've also watched us the establishment and stooges, sellouts have jumped on the cause, jumped on the bandwagon. Some of the fakest people I know, some of those that have the least concern for other individuals, for other humans at the front line, on the front using this this opportunity to further their careers in social media influencing or music or art or even um you know using it to benefit their businesses and i feel that profiting off pain is is a crime against against humanity you know um, I love to see people wanting to get involved people wanting to let the world know about their experiences I suppose a part of me is bitter because you know being part of an organisation that was set out for the for the youth and, and to do, tackle the youth violence you know the increase in knife crime the increase in murders in our inner city communities in our so called hoods and ghettos um, we made numerous pleas and calls and cries for the community to come out and support and you know we did have a lot of support but it's like when you got a budget behind you when you got a government behind you um, when you got George Soros behind you it's like sky's the limit of what people are willing to do to stand up and be counted for a cause people wanted to, in, in the UK at least you know people want to protest and they want to say enough is enough 
um, because of George Floyd, but when somebody on their own road, somebody that shared their own postcode, somebody they went to school with, somebody whose child they went to school with died and was murdered, they didn't take to the roads, they weren't moved to tears, they weren't moved to tearful uh, uh, videos on the internet or, or heartfelt speeches, everyone's trying to recreate the Braveheart speech is how it feels. Everyone's trying to manipulate, you know, and maybe it's a trait that we've been taught by the the powers that be, but I, I would like to see a lot more genuine, sincere brothers heading in a direction that's going to be truly beneficial to us. And unfortunately, with everything being, being um, done under the banner of Black Lives Matter, I feel like it cheapens our actual... Um, experiences and our actual pain and our actual grievances because I just feel like it's somebody else's cause that we're fighting for and we're building somebody else's machine and I have no idea what happens what that machine does once it's switched on and I'm scared I'm fearful for my brothers and sisters you know around the world that are, are following this Pied Piper that being said, if you're out there and you're protesting, you know, be safe. Um, put your safety first. And yeah, stand up for your brothers. Stand up for your brothers and that. But i got to ask you, where are we going with this? Like, the, with all the protests and that. Where are we going? What do we want? Where? What is our aims? Do we all have the same aims? Are we all heading in the same direction? Is this all going to die down in a few weeks? Um... Because I know I've had my fair share of prejudice, my fair share of doors being closed on me, my fair share of being stereotyped, being mistreated. I didn't even go into my, my years in foster care. I didn't even go into my multiple years in prison. I didn't go into my multiple years of being on the roadsides. I haven't gone into my multiple years of being a behavioural consultant and actually going to prisons, going to youth clubs and speaking to other children. I've not gone into like none of it. I've not even gone into gang, guiding new generation, none of the, being a youth worker now. I'm not going into none of that. I'm just going to give you one or two small examples that stood out to me, that actually highlighted that I lived in a world that didn't love me like I wanted to be loved or like I deserve to be loved. You know? And um, hopefully that this message, you know, means something to somebody. You know? I just felt like I'd write it down, read it out like a bit of a story. And... Um, you know, just share some of the things going through my mind without it being like some super, you know, over emotional thing I'm bawling or I'm shouting and screaming because I know like I show a lot of extreme emotions. I just thought I just, you know, like it's very early in the morning. I just thought I just, you know, share that with you lot in it. So yeah, big up yourselves. And um, of course, Black Lives Matter. Of course, All Lives Matter. Um, it just not, it just doesn't feel like that. It just you don't feel like that. That's uh, this is my way of showing you. It doesn't feel like that. Yeah, I could tell you about the time that police falsely entered my house when I was like six years old and destroyed my house right in front of me, smashed up my mum belongings, claiming that they were looking for cocaine. My mum, like me being a first generation uh, Nigerian, my mum just come from Nigeria. She got accent. She she got no time for fucking cocaine. They broke the shit out of my house, like a woman that was struggling to make her house. A home and you entered it with your police force and brute force and your racial stereotyping and you destroyed my home and that was the first time that was like my first interaction with the police you know um anyway there's there's too many stories like i don't want you to think that what i've told you today is by any way the the formative um memories i have like, I've got way more memories. And some of them um, might even be a bit too painful to even share at this moment in time. But yeah, man, big up to yourselves. And um, one love, innit?